What's going on? It's Ed here from Junk Marketing Team. Welcome to the Junk Removal Show. Casey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. All right. So I got Casey Walsh from Stand Up Guys Junk Removal. He's got a whole bunch of locations. He's making a whole bunch of revenue. Here to pick his brain, learn from his story. And uh, why don't we just jump right in? Give us a little bit of background on how you got started in the business. Uh, I can go real far back if you want. Um, I got, I mean, I was, you know, typical story. I dabbled in it here and there. Um, I was actually doing it back in high school in 2005. Okay. Um, I was, my, my father owned a construction business. And so he had an extra trailer and, you know, his customers would need things picked up here and there. And so he kind of taught me how to drive the trailer. I'd pick up things, take it to the dump. So I kind of learned that aspect of it. And there was a couple of times where someone would, you know, ask him like, Hey, can you take uh, this couch too, since you're taking the deck you just tore down or something like that. And so he'd tell him, uh, yeah, 50 bucks or something. And then we throw it in the trailer and I take it. And then it's kind of when the spark went off in my head, there's, you know, when I saw money and the service put together, you know, then I started putting little bandit signs out and I was doing the hauling things on the weekends while I was in high school. Um, but then I graduated and kind of went off to do you know, other things, nothing, nothing of importance. Um, and uh, right around the age 19, I read a book that kind of changed a lot of perspective for me and put me on, put me on the right path. And I decided that I was going to run my own business. I was going to work for myself and the one thing I did know was that I had been doing it before. So I just jumped right back into the junk game and that was 13 years ago. So okay. that's kind of how I got started in it. What was the book that changed your life? Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Awesome book. If you guys, yeah, I tell people all the time the story cause it's odd. Um, I was at a restaurant. Um, I was 19 years old. I was at a restaurant with some friends, you know, just doing absolutely nothing special. And as I was leaving, I was the last one in the rung of people walking down. And this guy reaches up and grabs me and he, and he kind of startled me at first. And he stands up and he's with his wife and I believe two kids. And he's like, Hey, I saw you sitting over there. I really want to tell you about this book that I read that I really wanted you to read. And it's like so off the wall. Cause I have no idea. Like why me, why this, whatever. And then he writes down on a, he takes out a, the receipt he had or whatever he had in front of him and wrote down that book and handed it to me. And I went and bought it the next day cause it was so weird. Um, and then I read it and I probably got halfway through it when I made the decision. I honestly don't even know if I ever finished the book, <laughs> but I, like I was so motivated reading it and it really changed my perspective. And like, I think going into it with the mindset that I, that I did about like this experience of this person telling me about it and how bizarre it was. So it's almost like I took the book more seriously than if I just had taken it off the shelf. Got it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a week later I had, I, you know, I started saving up my money. I was working two jobs, um, saved up, I think it was exactly $4,000 and I bought a pickup truck. I borrowed that old trailer from my dad and got to work. Got it. Now, it, yeah. um, so that, that's the, the nitty gritty of the start. Fast forward to today. Where, tell me a little bit about the business. Where, give me, you know, a 30,000 foot overview, trucks, trailers, you know. Yeah, so we... Know. Um, we've definitely grown a lot from that, from just me and a trailer. Um, so we now have seven locations. Um, in each location, we have a, a branch manager that controls all the operations there. Um, and then we have, you know, basically, a, we call this corporate. I'm here in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we have a branch here as well, but we have people here that help answer the phones for everybody. We do some bookkeeping and things like that here. Um, and then um, all together, I believe, 20, 25 trucks, something like that. Um, our home base in Atlanta is the biggest branch. It's still been growing after 10, 12 years. Um, and then we have a few other ones we're looking to open here in the next year or so. Very cool. So wh yeah. what markets are you in? Uh, we are in Tampa, Florida. And then down in Sarasota, we have two locations in Atlanta, Georgia, Raleigh, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, and Dallas, Texas. Awesome. Very cool. Um, how do you, so you've got some, some different size markets there. How do you determine what market you want to pick next? There's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason to it. I mean, people ask me, I actually get that question all the time. Um, and for the most part, we look for suburban areas. Um, but it doesn't matter where you go. People have junk. That's the, that's the one beauty about what we do is just like everybody has it. And right. so the need is literally everywhere. Um, 
you know, you definitely want to go somewhere where there's more people, the population can matter because then there's more work. Um, I look for similar comp similar, you know, competition and things like that. Cause you know, if you look up a certain city and you're thinking this would be a good place for us to go and there's no competition, it's, it's kind of, it should draw some red flags because it's, you know, why is, why is there, why is there no market here? Um, so sometimes you want to go where there's at least a little bit of a market, um, some competition. Um, but yeah, mostly population and suburban franchise or suburban size. Um, and a big part of it too is like, cause I, a lot of my managers that open up, they're moving from where they live. And so I, you know, I, I want them to go where they want to go. So a lot of times I let them pick it. You know, that's Dallas is kind of off the wall from the other ones. And that's because that's where that guy wanted to go. I mean, that's, you know, he had been a manager in Tampa for a while and he wanted a bigger city. He wanted another opportunity. And I said, any city you want. And he picked Dallas, Texas. The hell's so, an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that could, that could definitely turn into your biggest location. Oh yeah. Absolutely. It's the fastest growing so far. Awesome. Um, talk to me about marketing. Uh, what type of marketing do you do to drive business? So we do a lot of SEO work. We put a lot of work into our website. Um, that's always, you know, a big thing with me is I always have looked at it as we want to be found when someone's looking for us. Um, I've tried things like billboards and ad, like certain things that haven't really worked yep. um, because I think it is more about just being available when someone's looking for you is kind of how I perceive it. Um, but also we have a full-time salesman. So, you, you know, we have that. He's going to different businesses and calling on different people all over the, you know, on all these different cities. So you have someone full time looking, you know, constantly trying to sell towards that. Yep. Um, and then it's, it's a much longer play, but the biggest thing is our service. So like our customer service, when I have a lot of five-star reviews coming in, it seems to be around the time that we're getting busier and busier. Um, and I think you get a lot of people that are happy will tell their friends they'll use you again. Yep. There's all the positives that come from that. And like, that's kind of the snowball because like in our first year or so in a, in a branch, it's never really just like, we don't really get somewhere and it's just like gangbusters right away. Yep. It's really more of a gradual process. And the better your service, the, you know, people are going to tell their friends right. and they're going to use you again. Cause like our, the, one of the most things we're proud of at, at all of our branches is our, is our retention. Like the amount of, the amount of second, third, fourth, fifth time customers we have, is insane for it being junk. You think most of the time it's just like a one-time thing, but people call us a couple times a year and they're happy with the service and they keep calling, they keep calling. And that stuff really helps when it gets slow. You got your slow seasons in the winter and stuff like that. When you got repeat business, you almost never even feel it. Yep. Yep. It, do you use any software uh, to help automate the review generation process to get people to leave reviews? We use, uh, what is the name of it? We use like a text service. You just text people a link. Got it. Um, it's kind of, it's manual though. Like, so the guy, yeah, you guys you have to type it in. They have to do it. Um, yep. I don't have, we don't have anything in place. It's just like automatically doing it. Cool. Um, but this way I, th I like the, the, you can put, you can kind of personalize it from job to job too. Yep. Yep. Nice. When you deal with emails and things like that, I, I th there's so much spam out there that we try to kind of do things different because you know, I get, I probably get, I feel like I get 10, 15 emails a day about somebody, Hey, review your experience. And it's like, I don't ever do it. Right. It's, 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 unless you send me something that's a little different. Um, when it's, when you're doing what everybody else is doing, it just kind of gets drowned out. Right. Feel. Yeah. 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 You get like a hundred of them from Amazon a day. I don't feel like we're doing my, my paper towels that I just purchased. I'm good there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what do you use for, uh, for, for software to, to manage, um, your client relationships, billing, invoicing, or, or charging dispatch, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have, we kind of have our own custom CRM that we've built. Okay. Um, and then we use QuickBooks for a lot of the other stuff. So we kind of have just, we, we integrate what we've built with them. Got it. So yeah, yeah it's like, that's basically, I guess you'd call it proprietary something we've built over like probably like the last five years or so. We've put a lot of money and time into it. Um, it. So it's not like a service that we actually pay for. What's that? Um, I get a lot of people asking me if they should build their own versus getting something off the shelf. Has your experience building it been a inexpensive and easy process or has it been a nightmare? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to have a lot of aggravating days and, constantly asking people for help and not being able to figure things out. Like I did a lot of it myself and with my team and like, we're not tech guys. We're, right. we're hauling junk. Right. Um, 
So yeah, what took five years probably should have took someone uh, two months. So got it depends it. on how you look at it. Got it. <laughs> Fair enough. So you got a couple of trucks, just buy something off the shelf for a couple of there months. There you go. Yes. Make your life easier. There you go. Much, um, much easier. Right. Um, so I got a question from, from an SEO perspective. Um, with mm -hmm. SEO driving a lot of uh, business for you, are you, um, are you building out your assets in a new market prior to you getting there or you get there in that new market and then you start doing link building and content for that specific market? What's your approach there? We pro we try a little bit beforehand, um, but not like a, not a, not a terrible amount. Um, uh -huh. You know, cause we had one, it's actually recent. We did one where we had kind of planned on a certain city yep. and we did a bunch of build out to get there. And then COVID happened and it kind of, you know, it wound up not really hurting the junk business, I think like people thought, but in the, in the, you know, when it was happening, we kind of put a lot of things on hold. We stopped a lot of, we, we stopped a lot and we changed directions with certain things. So the person that was going to go out there, the assets that were going to go out there kind of reverted to somewhere else. And so then I put all this money and work into SEO for a city that now we're not going to. Um, but you know, I found reliable people out there that'll do the work. So if we get calls, we just try and give it to the people that can do it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So no, we don't, we don't do, we don't do long term build outs. Got it. Um, Got it. So testing, but, you know? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, what's some marketing that you've tested that has not worked effectively for you? Billboards. Oh, <laughs> that was, that's been one of the big ones where it's like, I've tried it a couple of times and it, you fall flat on your face. At least we have. Right. Um, and I, I have seen other companies do it. So I wonder if it works for them or not. Um, but for us, it has just been one of those things that, you know, a big sunken cost, at least it, this is how it appears. Um, but the thing is, every once in a while, someone will call you and they'll say, you know, you ask them, hey, how'd you hear about it? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I just always heard about you guys. And like, that to me is the best marketing you can have. Yep. Um, where it wasn't even like, it's just like, I've heard about you. I've seen you guys around or this or that. And it's like, because if someone was like, be like, hey, you know, where did you, uh, how'd you hear about Coca-Cola? You're not going to remember. It's not going to be the billboard you saw on I-40. You know, it's, it's more of, you just know about it. Um, right. And so we hear that every once in a while. So I, that's when I think, well, maybe the billboards in the past have been worth it. Maybe they haven't. I don't know. But it feels, that's always felt like the biggest sunk. It feels like we're trying to be bigger than we are. We have these big billboards on the highway and then it just feels like money down the drain. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, Talk to me about um, talk to me about early on in the business. You've got your trailer. How are you originally getting deals in the door? How are you getting customers besides your your relationships with your father and his contracting business? How else yeah. was the phone ringing for you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, like my father, like that was probably that's pretty much nil. There was never any really much work with that, especially when I, I started in two thousand eight. Is when I started. Um, time to start a business. Yes, exactly. So like there was no construction. There was nothing like that. That was also one of the reasons I could use this trailer. He wasn't using it anymore. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I used to, I just would, one of the big things I did and we still do it now is we put out bandit signs. Like we, and you so know, explain, I, I know, I know bandit signs from the real, uh, real estate investing space. Cause they're, they're, mm -hmm. they live on those. A lot of people yeah. don't know what bandit signs are. Explain what a bandit sign is. So it's the same. I mean, it's basically a little road sign, a little sign you see sitting on, like you see, uh, like this time of year, you'll see them everywhere for for politics. Yep. Um, uh, so what I would do um, back in 2008, 2009, there was a there was a sign shop probably five miles from my house, and I would go there in the middle of the night, uh, and I would go through their <laughs> their uh, dumpster, and I would pull all the old ones out that they were throwing away, and I'd take them back home, and during the day I would spray paint the the I would spray paint one side black so you couldn't see what was on it, flip it over to the blank side and just write junk removal with a, with a Sharpie. Um, you know, you get 500 signs out of that. You're saving roughly $2,000 by just doing it that way. But right. you have a handwritten sign on the side of the road. So the, the, what people expect when they call you is, is much more, is much lower. Uh, yeah. The expectations are, the bar is set very low. Um, but that was how I, you know, that was like guerrilla marketing. And I, I would do, you know, whenever the phone happened to ring, which seemed to be very rare, I would go do a job and I'd walk around the neighborhood and knock on people's doors and hand them cards and things like that. So it was a bunch of just, you just tell everyone you can. Right. I think that's the, you know, you'd be proud of, you know, I think about that with anyone that's starting a business, like be proud that you're starting something 
and tell everyone you know about it. Don't be like, you know, the part of me a little bit at times was thinking like, I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of like a garbage man or something. So sometimes I'd be slightly ashamed of what I was doing. Not ashamed, but just like not really that proud. But, but there came, you know, very early on, I got over that. And it was just like, I was proud of what I was doing. To me, I was a business owner, even though I was just one 19, 20 year old kid on a, in a 1984 Chevy pickup truck. Uh, but to me, I was a business owner. And when I really started to become proud of that, I was telling everybody I knew I would walk you know, door to door, put um, door hangers on doors and uh, flyers and mailboxes, just all kinds of stuff. I even would do the, um, we, I would print out little flyers on Microsoft Word, print them out and put them in the little trash bags or not trash bags, little uh, Ziploc bags. And then put pebbles in the bag so it had a little bit of weight to it and just drive around and throw them on, throw, throw them on the driveways. And like, awesome. and I don't know that any of that ever worked, but I was yeah. trying, you know, I was always just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what would stick. Um, but I think the biggest thing was when is really when you're just telling people, because like now anyone that knows me knows about stand up guys and they use our service, like just from friends and, and colleagues and other people that I've met over the years. Like we, I make tons of, we make tons of money and have tons of work just based on that alone which I think is, it, it doesn't feel like, it might not be like, the, it doesn't seem like, oh, that's the, the secret sauce to getting a bunch of work. But I mean, long-term, it pays off. Yep, yep. Death by a thousand cuts. Work yeah. And again, time. I always go back to when you do get work and the phone does ring, if you have good service, people will continue to call and then your customers will be your best marketing tool. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves to know a guy. So if, yep. you, if you're the guy that knows a really good junk guy, you like to tell your friends about it when they need it. Yep. Absolutely. It just it seems to work out that way. Right. Okay. Um, talk to me about the day you got off the truck and and started operating the business or, or managing the business as opposed to operating it. What led you to get off the truck? Talk to me about how that actually happened because that's a very scary moment for for a lot of operators. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it was a weird time. Uh, I remember the day specifically. I mean, we're talking about a long time. I mean, that's it was very important to me. I was very nervous. Um, describe the day. Um, it, it's kind of weird how it worked out with me. Yeah, it was. I had, I had an employee right, and he worked. He was a friend of. He was a close friend of mine. He had worked and he worked with me a lot. And then. Over the course of probably six months after he graduated from college, while working with me, you know, work was up, you know, when you're first getting started, it's up and down and whatnot. Yep. And you know, he came to me and he was like, hey, I got to take another job. I got an opportunity and you know, no hard feelings. And there wasn't any on my side. So it's just like, no problem, man. Like, I, I love you for it. And thanks for what you did. And so he left. And then I, I hired someone new and I made a commitment to this person that's like, you know, I'm going to give you the work that I can, blah, blah, blah. It hadn't been two weeks. And my old friend that had quit called me and he's like, I got fired from my job. They already laid me off because they, they figured they couldn't whatever. And he was like, anything you can do can help. Um, and it was literally, I just told him, I said, just come in tomorrow and we'll, we'll just kind of, I, I know you can work tomorrow and we'll fit, we'll figure it out. Um, and then that was that, next day I just put the both of them on the trucks because I had made commitments to the first guy and the second guy I wanted to help. And as I also saw it as like, here's my opportunity. And I just, I let them go and the rest is kind of history. I mean, there was a lot more to it. And, um, but that, I mean, the first day it was like, I didn't even tell the guy driving what he was making. <laughs> like we didn't have any, none of us knew what we were doing. And then when they, I remember the moment they drove off, I remember sitting and thinking like, what am I going to do now? I was just sitting there with my hands in my pocket. I had nothing. I had an apartment at the time and I was just sitting there and probably didn't, there's no good TV on at the time. I didn't know. And so like in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, what do I do? And that was, okay, I got to drum up business. Like then, then that became kind of my obsession was like, how do I now get the phone to ring? So that, cause if I'm answering the phone and booking jobs, I'm doing something. Right. Um, and so that kind of, that was like the process of me then now building something new. And then the guys out on the truck, it, it quickly kind of turned into something with the two of them. And, you know, just kind of the steps came from there. Okay. So from the time, <clears throat> the time you got off the truck to the time, you know, you were steady booked with the, the truck one, how, mm -hmm. how soon after did you get truck two? I would probably say six months, something like that. Maybe not even that long. Yeah. Fast. It was pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. 
I don't like to be bored. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> right. so it was, it was very quick. And I mean, but then the thing is bad is like, it's not easy because the second truck I remember was just as big of anxiety for me to think, okay, now I like, you know, trying to get a second truck on the road. And I'm pretty sure I was driving it in the beginning. Cause then it was like, I know I trust this one guy, but can I trust two people to drive, you know, all this other stuff. So it was, it's, there was still a big learning process and running two trucks in one day at that time felt like a monumental task. Um, mm -hmm. but that was the goal at the time. And then that's kind of where we went. Um, and then two trucks is around, you know, it, I think I was driving the second truck for a while, probably a short period of time, then trying to do what I was doing, answering the phones and driving the truck, doing all these things. And I quickly realized like, now I'm not booking as many jobs because I'm on the truck. Um, and so then I stepped back again. And then around that time, I convinced a, another friend of mine that was at a job that, you know, he was fresh out of college. And I think he just had like a regular I'm not sure what the job was and I convinced him to come work for me as a salesman and put him on his salary. And, uh, it really, it kind of took off from there. Cause then it was like a team of us okay. and then, and then, you know, it went from two to four pretty quickly and one location to two and kind of, you know, then that's when the, the ball really started rolling. Nice. What's yeah. the, um, what's the revenue, um, that you attach to, you say, okay, once I hit this, I'm bumping up and getting the next truck. And how much, how much new revenue do you allocate towards each new truck that you bring in? Uh, honestly, I've never really looked at it as revenue. Um, I mean, not that I should or shouldn't. Um, I've always looked at it more of call volume. So okay. it's more of, I don't ever want to be booked out a certain amount of time. It's like, if, if, if you call us and you need something removed and I tell you we can be out on this day and you say, well, that's too far. Yep. I need a new truck. Got it. That's kind of how I look at it. Like we want to be like, it's a, not, not an on call service, but it's a service that's like that people like it's a good service and good service is typically fairly quick. Yep. Um, so if, if we're booked out more, you know, a day or two, that's okay. But if it gets any farther than that, it starts to be like, okay, like we need to scale. We need to have more trucks. We need to be able to provide for more people. Um, I've never really looked at it like as revenue, but it, probably typically comes out to about 200,000 a truck, I would say okay. I mean, roughly about that. When you reach, I mean, a truck can do well over $200,000 a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say like, that's about the base. So once you're hitting that, you know that you could, the next hundred thousand could be done by another truck without too much stress. Cause you never want to put too much stress on a truck or too much stress on one crew. And you know, it makes, it makes everybody happier when, when the jobs are, you know, you have better routes too when you have more trucks because then you don't have to have one truck going in, uh, you know, 500 miles a day. Right. You know, stuff right. like that. Very cool. Um, uh, what is your thought when you decide to open up the next location? Are you hitting some sort of ceiling in, in a current market or are you just the, you have the entrepreneurial bug and you're like, all right, it's time. Let's do the next one. It, a little bit of a bug, but most of the time it's just people. Like I've based, I've based the growth, not, not just the growth, but I, I've based the, the business and the growth and the expansion. And a lot of it is based around people. So it's like when, when, when people come through the door that want to be part of this business and want, want to succeed, I always tell them like, if you want to be here and you want to like be part of this company, there's not one ounce of me that thinks that it wouldn't happen. There is people that come here. They like it it's just a job. It's a stepping stone. And then they move on to something else. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. But the guy that comes through my office is says, Casey, like, I want to be part of this company. I want to grow in the company. If that's really what you want, we'll just find something for you. And a lot of times I could be like, Hey, we'll open up a new branch. We'll make an assistant manager position. Like we'll do, we just do all kinds of things, but it's always for me, it's been based around people um, that, you know, that want to be part of what we're doing and, and, and want to succeed through here. I've never really pushed anybody. I've really never really tried to push anybody into being part of the company because I don't want to have to work at having someone care. I want to take the people that do care. And then, because like, as they make money, I make money. And we, so it's like a partnership in a lot of ways, even though, you know, we're all, it's one business and it's all owned it's like a corporate structure in a way. It's not a franchise, but it's, you know, as, as, as I make money, they make money. It, it really, we're all working together. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've really based the expansion off of people. Do, it's always been um, people. Do the managers in the, the satellite locations, do they own um, any equity in it or are they getting profit sharing? How do you compensate them to, to say? So hey. there's some, there's some, there's some profit sharing. Okay. It, it, there's no equity, but yeah, there's profit sharing. Um, right. And there's, so the, and there's, there's always, there's, there's plenty of incentive for growth and profitability. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about the, the manager role slash assistant manager role. Is that person answering calls? Or are you doing, they're doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're all they're, They, they're the owner of the business essentially in that location. Yeah. They're doing they're kind of like a franchise owner. Yeah. Without yeah. the liability. Got it. And do you guys take all of the inbound calls at the Tampa location at headquarters and do all the scheduling? It's, it's kind of mixed. Uh, depends yep. on the day. Um, yep. um, some of my managers like to be first on the phones. They want to be, they want to be the ones, uh, you know, booking the jobs and setting the schedule. And then, you know, anything they miss comes to us. And then sometimes it's vice versa, depending on what their day looks like. So the call center here will answer the phone. And if they, you know, if it, some of that gets missed, it goes to them. Um, it's, it, we kind of, there's no, there's no like exact thing. It's kind of set on the location, the manager, the day, you know, what, you know, sometimes the hour, the, what they're, what they got going on, you know, things like that. we just all work as a team to, because our goal is like all the phone, the phones always get answered. The customers always get taken care of. Yep. Um, no matter, you know, and we, like, and all, you know, we, we meet together too. So it's like all the managers all over all the States, we meet together. Um, we work together. We have ideas together. Like everything's kind of, you know, we're all in it together. Um, so everyone has someone, we, you know, we have each other's back. Yep. You're not in it alone. Got it. Very cool. Um, is that person responsible for like local bank accounts and P and L statements, or is it more of like the operations? Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's real. Just mainly like their job is operations and dealing with the guys. Like, like yeah. they're, they're, they're there to, and dealing with the customers when need be. Yep. Um, but like the, 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 the field guys and those like, it's the manager's job to take care of what those guys need, make their job easier. Nice. Um, and uh, it's my job to make the manager's job as easy as I can. Um, cool. So, you know, the, the bookkeeping and all that stuff kind of just comes through here. We don't put a yeah. burden on anybody. Got it. Cool. Um, let's see here. Um, if you're talking to the owner of a junk company, it's got one truck or one trailer. Um, what advice do you have for that person to take their business up to the next level? What advice? I guess, it, I mean, honestly, it depends on the person because everybody wants different things. Like mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if, if it's just, Hey, I want to make money for, if I, I just want to be happy and work less and, and make enough money for this, it's like, there's, there's a, there's a route you can take. And if there's, Hey, I want to, if you're, if, Hey, I want to be in every state and franchise, like I'm not the guy to give you the advice because I don't know. I've never done it. Um, but I think, I mean, the biggest thing is, I would, I'd say you, you need to trust people. You need to trust the people that you have and trust that they can do the job that, that needs to be done and just don't do everything yourself. Because if you try and do everything yourself, you're basically just giving parts of yourself to the different tasks that you need. You need to wear one hat at a time. If you're wearing multiple hats, like you're just, you're spinning your wheels. And I mean, I like, that's what I was saying. When I go back and I think back to some of the stuff I was doing, I was answering the phone and I have a, like, this, it was a while back. So it's like, things have changed a lot, but you know, I had a, I'd be answering a phone. I'd have a paper map on my hand that I was following as I'm driving with the stick shift truck that I have trying to book a job with a customer and figure out where I'm going. Cause GPS were too expensive back then. And, and trying to find a job and, and didn't the AC never worked in the truck. So I'm sweating and trying to, you know, they're just doing way too many things. So then uh, first of all, I could get into an accident. That's terrible. Second, the person on the phone is not getting good service because I'm distracted by five other things. And third, the customer where I'm headed, I'm probably going to be late because I'm <laughs> reading a paper map and talking on the phone. So I'm not going to, I don't even know where I'm going. So there's, you know, you don't want to try and be doing everything. It's better to trust people and trust that they can do it and take the risk in that because stepping off the truck is a big deal and it feels like a big risk. But again, it's, you know, I, I used to kind of look at it like, what's the worst that can happen? I got to go back on the truck. Yeah. Like that's the, you know, I really, in hindsight, looking back, like, yes, at the time, like I had anxiety about it. I was scared about it. It was something different. I had to trust someone else to do the job that only I could do. Um, and then you, you know, it turns out like there's been 50 guys that have come through the doors here that were way better at that job than I was. 
Um, and at the time I thought I was, like, no one could ever do it as well as me. Um, so you have to trust that people can do it and then you have to take the risks too. And stepping off the truck felt like a really big risk, but in hindsight, I think it really, it really wasn't. It's just more of like, what's the worst that can happen? Right. You got You got You let somebody down that does suck, but it's like, you let somebody down and you got to go right back to what you were doing. But micromanaging and trying to have your hands in everything and, and, and not trusting people to do like to go off on their own and do what they need to do. It, it you're, I just, it's hard to scale or ever be happy to Cause the, one of the best things that I love about where we're at now is like, I can go on vacation. Like I can literally take a vacation and my business still runs. And that might not seem like to someone that's an employee somewhere that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But when you run your own business, you realize that becomes a very big deal. Um, like, cause most business owners can't do that. Yep, my they, wife would agree. They, yeah. They, they, they got their hands in too much. And sometimes, so it's like, if you have your hands in so much that you're constantly working and the business won't operate without you, you're still a business owner, but you work for that business. You don't yep. get to work on it all the time. Like you are, you're an employee. And like, yep one of the reasons a lot of us want to own our own business is because we don't want to be employees anymore. Mm -hmm. So if your business can't run without you, there's a big part of you as an employee as well Got with it. the burden of being a business owner. Right. So you got to get it at both ends. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, having faith in the, uh, the, the employee to, to do the job and, and trust. Mm -hmm. Are you a proponent of building systems in your business and standard operating procedures and checklists and things like that? Can you talk a little oh, bit about yeah. that? Oh yeah. I mean, I, right here. this book right here is a like the e-myth. I know I've heard a lot of people talk about this book, but like I've read this book, I've had to have read it five or six times. Um, and like the whole turnkey revolution, I think is what he calls it in this book mm -hmm. um, about building systems and processes to where your business is running itself. I mean, that kind of goes back to trusting people, like I said, but like tr and trusting the process that you've built. Um, I am the biggest proponent of it. Um, am I the best at it? No, but like, I know when it works, like I know that it works and like, that's what I'm always, I'm always trying to build things so that it runs smoothly on its own. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think in this book, it, you know, it, it kind of talks about build extraordinary processes that ordinary people can succeed in. Um, mm -hmm. That is easier said than done because I've, I've said it a hundred, you know, I've said it a bunch. Like I believe that you really do need good people to, to run a good business, especially in the service business, because I can't be on site for every single job when the, when my people are talking to a customer. Um, and it doesn't matter how many processes you build, that individual still has to act a certain way and treat that customer in a certain way face to face. So you can build all the processes and systems in the world, but if you have crappy people doing it, they're going to treat your customers crappy. Um, so it's not everything, but that has been a huge, that has been a huge part of me building my business on all the other, on other, so many other aspects of, you know, invoicing and management and trucks and, and just all kinds of other things where we have systems in place that I don't have to be doing everything all the time. And the managers don't have to be doing everything all the time. Cause like what a manager had to do five years ago in this company and what they have to do now is far less. Um, because of the, the, pro the systems and the processes we have. And I learned, I will say, I learned a lot of it from that book. Cool. So give me, give me an example of a system in your business. Just, you know, someone that doesn't know what a system is or how to build one. Can you give me an example of what one might look like? <clears throat> uh, I mean, I would say anything like, like with invoicing, um, like how our invoicing system flows from one thing to the next. It used to be where, um, a manager would have to put something on the schedule and then email the customer a confirmation. And then the crew leader has to take that information and put it into uh, another system. And then, you know, like a, like a uh, QuickBooks or something like that yep. and then invoice the customer and then take the payment. And then the manager the next day has to take that information and, and put it into here for the bookkeeping process, you know, for the bookkeeping purposes. And then also hopefully remember to take that person's phone number and, text them, Hey, please leave us a review. And then also send the phone number to someone that needs to call them to, you know? And so those are all different things that are, those are, that's five, six, seven different things that have to happen in a good system. It'll all just flow together. And that's kind of what we built here with something like that. Like you input information once and then the, then the, re the process, the rest of it does it for you. 
like yep. it, where you're taking away steps for people to have to do it. So if the system's working better, it takes out the human error of it. And it also takes out the someone having to put man hours into doing all these different things. Got it. And um, in terms of systems for pricing and your inbound call center and people that take mm -hmm. calls, do you, um, do you have like a, a pricing book? Do you price it per um, segments of the truck per item? How do you price things out over the phone in, in, in seven different markets? Um, we try really, we try really, really hard not to. Um, one of kind of the goal when we answer the phone is to get the person on the schedule. Okay. Uh, we look at it as the guys that are out on the truck, their job is to sell our jobs. Okay. Um, I have talked to plenty of individuals that think differently and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. It's just the way that we've done it. Um, you know, if a, if a customer calls in and they say, this is what I have and I want to get rid of it. Um, you know, I will, you know, we'll try and give them ballparks here and there if they really want it. Um, but you know, the, what it takes to find out exactly what somebody has and exactly where it's at and what it'll cost is sending the customer through steps. Now they're put now you're putting them to work in order for you to get a price so that you don't feel like you're wasting your time by going out there and giving them a free estimate. Um, and so that's kind of the risk we take. We just say, Hey, this is what we do. And we will come out, we'll take a look at it for free. Um, and we take the risk in there. They might not like our price and we just wasted the gas and the, the, the hours to go over there um, and wasted the time slot. But we feel, you know, confident that like our service and our prices are good enough that it's rarely going to happen. Um, and I think that we get more from that than if we were to take the customer through the process of, Hey, go take a picture of it, then send it to me. Then I'll call you back and then I'll agree with the price for you. And then I'll come out that can work. And then you'll never waste your time going to a job. You're not supposed to, right. But you might book far less, but I could be wrong. You know, that, that's what, like, I think that there's, there's differing thoughts on that. That's just kind of how we've done it. Yep. I, I try to take the onus off the customers. Like when you call in, I want you, I want you to call in and off the phone in less than three minutes. So it's like, cause if I'm a customer and I'm calling somebody, I really like it when I don't have to sit on the phone and answer a bunch of questions. It's just yep. like, Hey, I got this. Can you come get it? Yeah. When can you be here? Cool. Thank you. <laughs> that's to me, right. if I'm calling in someone like that was nice. And like, that's the per first part of our service. Like that's the, that's the opening line, you know, so like that we want it to be quick and easy and polite. And so then people can move on with the rest of their day. I don't want you to go take a picture of everything you have and then like guess the weight and give me, you know, there's so many things you can do to try and get like an exact price. And that to me is just putting the customer to work when that should be you doing the work. Got it. Do you have a, do you have a number that, that opts not to go with you once they're on location and have given a quote? What do you mean? <clears throat> so you go out to a hundred jobs, <clears throat> hundred free estimates. Um, yeah. do you have a percentage of those that actually do the work versus don't do the work? I would say, I don't know the exact number, but it's definitely over 90%. We do it. I would say. Got it. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. I mean, we, you know, I mean, we, you know, we kind of have a feeling with customers too. Like you make sure they know it's not free. Cause I know that's right. some learning <laughs> processes I went through. There's plenty of times right. I get out to a job and like, I didn't do enough explaining and the, you know, the person that's there is thinking like, Oh, I have to pay you for this. And like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no way to talk someone from free to spend it. Like that's a big, that's a hard that's negotiation. A hard like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard sell. So there's certain things that you kind of learn and, and little like, you know, ways to explain to somebody like, this is kind of where our prices are and this is how we work. Um, but then of course there's always the people, anyone that is in this business knows there's going to be people that press and press and press for, for, prices right and then you just try, you try to you try to give them as much as you can i guess it's like we try and have our 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 guys out on the field like they're in charge of that that's their job so we let them do their job got it and is that is that the the truck leader does the the selling on site yep. does he get a, a commission on yep. daily is it daily weekly monthly how does he get his right? daily daily yeah okay so it's kind of based on yeah so you got good ones and you got bad ones you know yep. and a lot of times the ones that are best with customers seem to be the best with money too. It all kind of always correlates. The better your service, the more money you make. Nice. Um, you're big on hiring good people. Um, what do you do internally to help build the culture, especially now that you're in 
a bunch of different markets. How do you, how do you keep that culture alive and going? That is a very, that's a hard question. I mean, that's like, um, that's something we're constantly focusing on. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, this isn't, you don't get like someone doesn't go to college and then graduate and say, I really went to college and I graduated because I really want to work for a junk removal company. Mm -hmm. So you don't always get people coming through the door that are super enthusiastic. Um, but it doesn't mean that we don't, I mean, we get plenty of, we get really good people that come through these doors. Um, but I think we have really been able to keep a, a very good culture through all these branches. Cause I, I, I visit them all multiple times a year. I'm constantly got my finger on the pulse with, with different employees and different managers in different locations. And I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier is I grow the, we grow the business based on people that want to be here. So when your manager is enthusiastic about the place that he works, I feel like that bleeds down into the customer or bleeds down into the other guys that work under him. Um, and, you know, cause like there's been one time, once or twice, we've kind of had some um, turnover with management mm -hmm. and you kind of plug somebody in for a short period of time. And all of a sudden all the employees aren't as like, the, all of a sudden you're not finding as good of people and the service isn't quite as good. And I guess my point is like management really, 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 man, really matters. Um, and I think when you have people that care about the business are in charge, the people that they're in charge of care more. Nothing's, there's not a quicker way to care less about your job when your manager doesn't even care about where they work. Absolutely. Um, and I think that might be the biggest, that's a, that's the biggest part of us keeping our culture. And like, you know, it, it started with five, six, seven of us in Atlanta, Georgia in 2010. I mean, it's when the culture really started building and, a lot of those people, you know, some of those guys are still here. Um, some of them are managers and, and higher than that. And I think that that's that little group we had, that culture that we built has kind of bled down throughout the years and the different people that have been part of it is really helped. But yeah, I think, I think I, I give my credit to the managers. Very cool. All right. Final four questions of the interview. Um, number one, what's the, what's the last book that you read? Uh, no excuses by Brian Tracy. Awesome. It's a pretty good book. Yeah. I'm Brian Tracy. That's the last like business book I read. I actually okay. read, a. Uh, I think the last book I read, which one was that? It was a uh, recursion by Blake Crouch. It's a, it's a uh, fiction book, but it was good. <laughs> but yeah, no excuses by Brian Tracy is a really good book. Okay. It, it t it's kind of talking about like, you know, just, if you want something, you just, you just do it. You, you don't make excuses about why not, why not, why not? Just, if you want something, you just kind of go after it. And I, you know, and I think that that it's good for people to hear, especially if you're trying to start a business, it's like, just drop the excuses. You, you got into this for a reason. Just go for it. Yep. Yep. Um, what's your favorite book? The E-Myth. E-Myth? Yeah, that it really is. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of why I pulled it out. I mean, that's like, that's, I've read that book so many times and, it's not like a, not a page turner or, Oh my God, I can't put it down. But when it comes to running a business, if you want to be, if you want to work on your business and not in it, that's the best book I could ever recommend. I know there's a lot of books out there that have come out since then. It's an older book. Yep. Um, but that's, yeah, for me in business, that's been, that's been the, that's like my Bible in a way. Yeah. yeah it definitely hits you like a, a ton of bricks. Yes, it does. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of reading, you know, before we came on live um, or recording, we we're talking about books. Um, how important is reading to you and, and continuing education and self-education? How important is that to you in the growth of your business and you personally? Um, I don't know how important it is with the business. I mean, it probably is. And me personally, it's very important. Um, I was never an avid reader until probably about five years ago. I kind of, forced myself I said you know I, I think you know I, I just really wanted to start reading I started making goals of how many books I was going to read and, and now I'm it's probably about 30 a year um and so I'm always in the middle of a book I'm always reading and it really it, it helps me personally and I've learned a lot from some of the, especially the business books I've read um or even the biographies like I read uh Shoe Dog by Phil Knight probably a couple months ago you read that I have terrific book and like you know so sitting like there's no there's no there's nothing in there that says, um, 
here are the steps you need to take and you will be successful. But it's more of like you see what other people have done and you read these things and you see like what successful people do and how they run their lives. And, you know, that definitely helps and you learn from that. Um, and then I think the, the better I take care of myself as running a business, I assume that it's going to help the business. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would say it definitely helps me a lot. Cool. Um, what advice would you tell your 20 year old self? I would, I would probably tell myself to kind of let it fly. I think, I, I think there was a lot of times where I'd hold, you know, I, I would be scared to spend money. Um, almost like I had a, like a scarcity mentality. Like I got to get all the work because you never know when it's going to run out. I don't know if that's a prime product of starting a business in the middle of a recession or not, or if that's just my personality. Um, but until I kind of like, literally just let it fly. Like just, just take risks and, and go for it um, with certain things. And, and if you make money, spend it like on, on and reinvest it into yourself. Don't like, don't hoard it and then spend a little bit here and there. Cause that's, that really is what makes it take longer. Um, when I started make, when we started getting profits and I would roll those profits right back into the business, like the, just the whole thing, just the whole heap of it um, is really when things started to snowball better. And like, I, you know, I would have read this e-myth a lot earlier too. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the big thing is just, is kind of go for what you want and don't, don't have a scarce mentality. You know, there was a lot of times I'd see other junk removal companies and they make my blood boil because they're going to try and take some of my work. It's like, there's plenty of work out there for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and don't, don't, don't be scared to spend money on your, on your business. I, you know, I didn't have a nice truck. I probably didn't have a truck with AC until 2014. So we would, I'd skimp on my trucks yeah. and I, I feel bad even saying that. Cause like I had guys working for me, that, but it just became the norm. I mean, we'd had, we had trucks that didn't dump. They were just like flat beds and didn't have AC. So these guys are hand unloading and this and that. And like, I'm thinking, well, I saved the money on the truck. The truck didn't cost as much as this one. But then when you think about it later on, it's like, you don't look as good to the customer. Your brand doesn't look as good. They're spending more time at the dumps. So those are man hours. Like all those things, like spend your money on your equipment and spend money on your people. Because if people, I mean, probably even more than that, and more than the equipment, like if you find good people, pay them good because you want them to stick around because they're not always just going to be walking through the door. Um, but yeah, it's just like, let it fly. That's what I would tell myself. Cool. I like that. Let it fly. Uh, last question is what's the best you've, uh, advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? Um, the best advice. Probably my probably my father. I used to, I've, I mean, I've been with my father my whole life, but he used to always tell me just do something. Anytime I would be got my hands in my pockets or I'd be on the job with him, it would always be like, just do something. I, I don't care if you do it right or wrong or just do something. So I don't see you standing there. Um, and that is like, and he kind of tells me that with a lot of things. Like, you know, I think that if you have anxiety about something, action is going to solve it. Um, if you think I need to lose some weight, don't think about it. Just go start doing something, start running, start eating better. Um, it just, even if you're moving in the wrong direction, as long as you're moving, you, you can gain some momentum. Um, and so it's, yeah, just, just do something. <laughs> That's literally probably the best advice I ever got. Always be doing something, be moving forward. I like it. That's how I look at that. Yeah. Cool. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, if they've seen this interview and they want to come work for you and they want to become your next branch manager in the next location, um, how do people uh, learn more about you? Um, so we are on, you know, stand up guys all over social media, read Facebook, Instagram, all that. Our website, our website, standupguys.biz. I, um, you can literally pick up the phone and like, I might be the one that answers. So it's, I'm very easy to get in touch with. Um, you can, you can email me like anybody wants to talk to me. It's not hard at all. Cool. I think you found me. What was that? LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn, there you go. I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm easy to, I'm easy to get in touch with. Cool. Let's and I'm always, great. I'm always up to talk I'm all right. like this. I love this stuff. Awesome. This has been great. Um, do you have any, any parting wisdom or anything like that you want to drop before we uh, wrap this I up? Think, I think we, I think that was everything. Cool. Casey, this has been great. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.